We're back. We had so much catching up to do with Brody that we decided to split this into two episodes. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is part two. That's a perfect segue to get into this episode because of how it, it starts, you know? I mean, they're they're bunking together and then Seth Seth wakes up Ryan to say, are you awake? Are you awake? Are you awake? Because he needs to have, you know, he needs- Talk more about himself. Talk more about himself <laughs> yeah. and what's going on. And, yeah. and, and, and it's just like these, these classic, I mean, going through these episodes, it was not every episode, but almost every other episode opened with these classic- Ryan Seth scenes and this these these very wordy monologues of Seth's either neuroses or you know his 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 constant critique of his relationship or the self-absorption and Ryan just listening because that's that's who he is he listens Seth is wildly self-absorbed which is not the greatest attribute that's I guess what my point is wildly but 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 so endearing. It comes up a lot in these episodes. We're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. here we go yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were your thoughts about you and Ryan sharing a room in your McMansion? I didn't have any thoughts on that. I, I do think that, you know, the house itself, I was looking at the house going, I surf, you know, up in LA a lot now, and I drive by the area up, you know, in very North County where that the hill outside that, that how, the real house that we shot the pilot um, was on, but it was burned down, I think believe a couple of years mm-hmm. ago in uh, one of the big fires. And so I do think about that house and shooting the pilot and just, you know, and it being gone. And I don't know. I don't know what I think of it. I just think of it. Nostalgia. And, and uh, yeah. And so, you know, seeing the house, more like seeing the house itself duplicated. And I always thought that that pool was so cool <laughs> that, you know, such a Hollywood set, you know, that, I mean, the pool is only like three feet deep, but just that we had a pool indoors, you know, um, Pretending to be outdoors, I, I did and still do, I guess, get a kick out of that. But um, as to us bunking up together, you know, no, no thoughts. People always comment cool. on the fact that what that house is so big, there must be a guest room. But oh yeah, Haley, yeah, yeah. But Haley lives there too, so I'm assuming she might have one of the beds. But but guys, it really is just a tool so that Seth and Ryan can have scenes together in the bedroom. That's yeah. essentially so, why. So you can wake him up. Yeah. <laughs> so you can wake him up. And, and talk his ear off. Right, right. The pool house. <laughs> Did you? Spent a lot of time in that pool house. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Did you always look forward to those scenes, those opening scenes, those monologues? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had so much fun acting with all. I mean, truthfully, Melinda, we didn't get to do all that much together, unfortunately. We spent a lot of time together through the years. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I always, I mean... Rachel and Ben, my two, you know, go-to one-on-one scene partners. And then we had a lot of family. It's like the two scenes I remember, things I remember doing the most is, you know, one-on-one scenes with Rachel or Ben and, or um, the big family scenes around the breakfast table. Those were fun because I loved acting with uh, Peter and Kristen. But anyways, it was also hard because it was, it takes a long time to shoot. And so, Mm -hmm. well, we always, (laughs) Peter and Kelly, is that what you meant? Peter and Kelly. Well, we always noticed those, those Cohen kitchen breakfast were very highly choreographed and they were kind of the highlight of the episode oftentimes for myself. And there's even one here, Julie and Caleb are, are, she's trying to get Caleb to decide on where they're going to get married, which is odd. But then the whole Vegas thing comes up. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I love the Vegas. We sure said the Vegas a lot. <laughs> Got that in there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. They really drilled that one. <laughs> the beginning of the episode, like, obviously, you know, Vegas is happening. And you guys invite yourself to Vegas. I remember being like, Josh, I have to go to Vegas. Like, I personally told Josh that I had to be in Vegas when you guys were going to Vegas to shoot this. Because ironically, it, like, <laughs> parallels what's going on with <laughs> Seth and Summer. And Summer's like, Seth's going to Vegas? And, you know, she, like, has broken up with you because she disapproves of how you acted in front of her dad. Um, and her dad's not accepting you. And so she kind of breaks up with you. But then she's, like, upset you're going to Vegas and, like, wants to be there because, well, anyway, we'll get into that. But I was like, Josh, Brody is not going to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> without me. I need to be there. I was like, fuck that. I'm going to be yeah, there. That's so funny. Wait, so, so Josh funny. wrote, I was not supposed to be in Vegas, but Josh, I wrote, Josh wrote me in <laughs> to go to Vegas because I was like begging him. I had to be there. 
And I don't know if the whole storyline, like, with the dad came about because I was like, dude, right. I'm going to Vegas or what? Uh, did you read the original script and you and you don't go and then you took it to him? Or did you just find out? I don't remember. Yeah. Probably I don't remember. Just, we would hear things coming down the pike, like, mm-hmm. going to have a Vegas episode coming up or whatever. Uh, like, I'm sure right. before like, we read it. Who's going to heard, Vegas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it worked out. I mean, it, it's it's a good storyline, too. I love the I love your appearance. Skanks. <laughs> Oh my gosh, vicious. It's funny. Like, I know we shot in Miami. And I know we shot in Vegas. Or was it Miami? No, no. Shit. Uh, (laughs) Wait, was I like, I have to go to Miami? Anyway. Let's stick with Vegas. This makes sense. Let's stick with Vegas. Um, I remember being in Miami for, I have like one vision of just like a lobby or something. And then Vegas too. Like, I don't remember. Ironically, I, I, I hate Vegas. Right. Hate it. Seth certainly so, loves the Vegas. The beginning. Seth of this. loves the Vegas. I haven't hated the Vegas. First of all, going to Vegas, there are these amazing establishing shots. And I've been in touch with Jamie Barber, our DP. And I thought, I wonder if this is stock footage. So I asked him. And sure enough, you guys or we shot the the exta- um, establishing shots over Vegas, very much like an ode to um, Ocean's Eleven with the music and everything. He also said, and then of course you're at the Hard Rock, and and I thought there must be some deal with the Hard Rock because it's being, you know, featured on the show. And he said that you guys flew the Hard Rock jet to, do you remember that to Vegas? No, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, um, and one of the things that he said was when you guys were on the floor of the casino, that the sound guy actually won a jackpot, and they had to during rolling, and they had to reshoot at some point. Do you remember being on the casino floor? Was it particularly hard, difficult with all the people and the sound? Because it sounded like there was a lot of ADR and such. I do not remember being in Las Vegas. Oh, really? (laughs) Period. (laughs) No. We're a great pair. (laughs) The two of us should just rehash all Uh, these. (laughs) um, I certainly, and I've never, I mean, to my knowledge, like that's the only time I would have been on a private jet. So I would think I would remember it, but I don't. I don't remember a private Uh, jet. They probably Uh, made me drive. Yeah, that's right. Take a bus. Oh, Missy Halperin <laughs> from Fox. Remember the vice president of Fox Marketing? She 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 sent yeah. you guys. Well, she told me the story, but she sent me sent you guys on a jet to the Billboard Awards. So, you, you in Vegas? <laughs> yeah, you guys have been on right? from in Vegas. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember all those things. <laughs> Wait, I just have to say because I do remember that it was Vegas. He wrote me into Miami. I w- I just went, but I wasn't in the episode. It's you tagging along. Yeah, I mean, you know, I had to be everywhere. Yeah. Probably everywhere you were because I was like a young girlfriend with like a very <laughs> successful, famous, crush-worthy boyfriend. It's like, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will be there. You don't remember being there, but you did watch the episode. Yeah, yes, yes. This penthouse, right, at the Hard Rock, is a. it's like a 5,000 square foot penthouse. Uh-huh. And... Uh-huh. I've been either in that one or the one at the Palms. I don't remember getting there uh-huh. or how that happened because, you know, it was Vegas. But, but um, so you don't remember being in that penthouse. It's a, I think it's a pretty famous one. I mean, I think like the bowling rings a bell. And I don't know if it's, I remember actually bowling or if I remember just being, uh, watching. I've seen this episode before, you know right. what I mean? Like, so, so I, I don't know if, um, I never know if my memories are from pictures or my actual brain. I remember specifically things about the pilot and I was sitting on this chair and Ben said this. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I remember there's, you know, obviously like things that stick out in my memory, but, you know, doing it, this show five days a week, 12 hours a day, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff I don't remember filming, you know, it sort of blurs. Yeah, this is one of them. I mean, I didn't remember my old co-star Kristen was in this until until I saw it and then I rang a bell that, you know. (laughs) Yeah. but uh, it was a it was a surprise. It was a pleasant surprise. I was like, uh, "What?" You're like, "I know what? her." Yeah. So she plays the girl that comes up to you at the pool at the Hard Rock. Yeah, and yeah. She yeah. does the whole thing. I'm watching it, and honestly, I completely forgot she was a prostitute. Like, I didn't yeah. know yeah, until yeah, the end. Yeah. I was like, "Oh shit, she's a hooker!" Like, and yeah, you know, everyone yeah. else is like, "Oh, saw that coming," and I was like, "No." Like, I didn't. Even, I didn't. No, me either. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course, a girl is hitting on me and wants to like. She was wearing glasses at the pool. Yeah, she's got Stunning. and she has a book and glasses, and of course, that's what she is. And I guess yeah, no, I'm I'm. I probably thought the same thing, and but I've seen the show so many times. Well, the first time I went to Vegas, I was 21. And no, sorry, I was 20. So I was underage and I was terrified they were going to kick me out just like Ryan and Seth. 
And I ended up with hives all over my body. Like I was allergic to Vegas. I hated it so much. I was just so, ah. My 21st was in Vegas, like right before the oh, show. Wow. Oh, wow. I remember going, I went to Josh's bachelor party in Las Vegas. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> <gasps> we took, oh my God, Josh is going to kill me. Wait, was I there for that? Or was this when we were shooting and we were at a strip club and I was like, I made maybe Josh can get a stripper and then he was trying to get you a stripper and I was like, oh no. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know when this was from. I don't know. I, if, I, you don't have to speak on it, but I Josh don't has told remember. the story. I remember this bachelor party. I do not remember... Um, I wouldn't have been at the bachelor strip party. Club. But I guess that makes sense. But yeah, I think Josh, we got Josh a stripper and he was mortified. Uh, and he wanted to get you one. And I was like, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe when we were shooting. Speaking of stripping, Julie is <laughs> on a warpath to get. You have great stuff in this episode. And I love how your eyes light up <laughs> several times. She gets very this. excited. And I feel yeah. like, Mindy, it's also a little very... you. Like, you would totally be into it and having fun and like not saying that you love strippers, but just that you would have fun with the situation. <laughs> Julie is on this war path and talking about stripping about, and, and when people ask me my favorite scene or favorite dialogue, I always refer to this scene. Just one stripper who never hurt anyone, just trying to make his way in the world naked. I remember this. <laughs> I, it is That was like the only real part that I remembered of this. I, I remember your storyline actually very much more than I, I did. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't know that UNLV student was a prostitute. I didn't remember that watching this again, mm -hmm. but I very much remembered the strippers and the strip. The, it's a memorable episode. But I think one of the things that's kind of memorable is, and of course I had to look this up, full frontal male stripping is not commonly requested. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, there uh -huh. might be a magic mic. I've been to the th Thunder Down Under in, in um, yeah, Vegas. Yeah. I'm Just, a fan of the poster. <laughs> right. <laughs> in that respect, I am not like Julie at all. But I do appreciate the magic mic for sure. But uh, but yeah, if if there's any time that was, I definitely dance on was tables. Was Julie requesting full frontal? Uh, was she requesting full frontal? Yeah, yes. and I actually yeah, is that what? Nice. Yeah. I actually looked it up and and sure, and it said, well, it's not necessary. I was like, is that even legal? And the 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 answer from Google was that it's not necessarily illegal. It's just not you know popular. So. Right. So yeah, Julie asking for that. And, and Kelly and I, she could not keep a straight face during this scene. And, but I just had fun, but that was an example of I'm comfortable, I'm confident, and I'm just going to be Julie Cooper bigger than life. Yeah. And, uh, and, and those were the days where it was just so much fun to go to work. I was watching it and watching everyone dance in like a brightly lit living room right. with these guys. And I was like, this is probably nine 15 in the morning. Too, and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're like, they get, people are walking around with hors d'oeuvres of like old deviled eggs and I don't know what. And seemed seemed like fun to watch and maybe not that fun to do, but I'm glad you had fun. The strippers were wearing these underwear that were, I think they were TV approved. You know, they weren't, uh, they yeah, were actually yeah, yeah. kind of these yeah. big red, almost diapers, like very, very unsexy. When you get in a fight with Amanda in the pool, there's a nice, they go out on a nice um, Kelly Rowan and then she's framed nicely. I wanted them to pan over a little more, but there's like, you know, there's some male genitalia, like just right, right over, over her shoulder. shoulder. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. I remember actually <laughs> arguing with the AD and he was saying, we, you know, we have stunt doubles for this. And I was like, why? And he said, because it's not even three feet deep. And if you jump in and you hurt your leg and I was like, come on, it's not that big of a deal. I want to do my own stunt. Come on. And at one point I said, see, and I jumped in, I guess, I don't know. I jumped in and sure enough, I was this close to hurting my ankle. So I went, okay, you're right. I'll let the stunt people do it. But <laughs> um, we had Amanda Rigetti on last week. So we talked about that. I remember, I think she's younger than me. I think that was yes. the like, funny thing was. She know. was younger than all of us. She was 20. Yeah. Okay. Except Misha. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Playing your That's why I was like, what is going on? It's you three on the couch. Um, you, Rachel, and Misha and her. And I'm yeah. like. I remembered she was my aunt, but I was like, I forgot that she dated Tate. I forgot like how, you know, <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, cause obviously again, yeah, you're all the same age. Um, I don't know what's happening, but anyways, that was, 
That was magic. Interesting. But that was a cute, very awkward scene where she's talking about having sex it with was. Jimmy. I mean, <laughs> listen, on, on, on one hand, it's a lot of story to go through. It's a lot of um, crossover. It's very incestuous very early on. And at the same time, pretty entertaining. Like, I liked all of it. I, I was, I was, you know, I wasn't mad at any of it. I am a huge foodie. I'm a huge fan of restaurants, but sometimes if I don't feel like going out, I cook at home. And using HelloFresh gives me the best of both worlds. They have restaurant quality meals with their gourmet recipes like balsamic fig sirloin. Mm. HelloFresh offers 50 weekly recipes featuring a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients so you'll never get bored. Try something new every week. I have been so enjoying HelloFresh and... You know what I made besides that balsamic fig sirloin? I made squash agnolotti with bacon and scallops and then some silky Sicilian penne. You know, it's like a Hall of Fame recipe entree for them. Okay, so my daughter loves to cook with me and having everything delivered and everything I need to actually make the meal makes it so much more fun for me anyway. But Briar is an awesome cook and we have so much fun doing HelloFresh together and she loves all of their pasta dishes. It's really kid-friendly too, which I love. Eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options every week. And no matter what you choose, every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. You know what else I love about HelloFresh besides the actual food? They give back. HelloFresh has already donated over 4 million meals to charity in 2020. And now they're stepping up food donations to local communities amid the food insecurity crisis and pandemic. Go to hellofresh.com slash OC14 and use code OC14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. That's hellofresh.com slash OC14 and use code OC14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. I love Fable Home. I I have like a weird obsession with dinnerware and dishes and just table settings. Their stuff is so cute and it mixed so perfectly in with all of the pieces I already had. I've just been so excited by gaining this beautiful dinnerware. I totally agree. I love it. It's beautiful. It's functional. And I, I really love the sturdy weight of it. The quality is excellent. Their ceramic dinnerware goes beyond just looking amazing. It's sustainably crafted so you can feel good about using it. Fable Home only partners with makers who put the earth and its people first. This means that the plates are created from recycled clay. The packaging is eco-friendly and it's all 100% non-toxic. The dinnerware is classic enough to use every day, but will also impress any guests you have over. Head over to fablehome.co and use the code VOC to take 10% off your first purchase. That's 10% off when you visit fablehome.co and use code VOC. We've been noticing is that the show is, it's, I either laugh out loud or actually cry at any given moment during these shows. And it really is entertaining. And a lot of those, a lot of those entertaining moments do come from the dialogue and these, these epic monologues that you, that, Mm -hmm, that Seth has. mm -hmm. And I mean, you have so many funny one of one of the, I actually started our document with a quote that's from the Rainy Day Women, I, and it said, "Here we go, buddy. Hours of mind numbing escapism." That that Seth says to Ryan, talking about watching TV, and and I think that's a comment of of Josh making fun of the show being, yeah. you know, this guilty pleasure of escapism. Yeah, yeah. He really uh, wrote some funny stuff. Some really funny dialogue for everyone. And even now I watch it and I go, oh, that's written really funny. I could deliver it better. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm still, a, I, I'm still, well, I'm still appreciative though. I mean, of his writing above all else. Did you start doing, because I know a lot of comedians actually prepare their improvs or say, this is how I could end a scene. Or did you bring in ideas, you know, before, when you were preparing the night before, or did you do it in the moment? Mostly before, but not like the night before, mostly like while I'm in the makeup Mm -hmm. trailer looking at the sides or while I'm like sitting in the chair, we're about to go. It's like, I'll think of, I'll try and think of stuff. That's when I cram and try and think of a few alts. And then sometimes in the moment, I've never been like, I'm not schooled in improv. I don't, you know, I would don't think of myself as, even though it's a joy, it's actually my most 
my favorite thing to do in acting is like to get a laugh. That's a more fun to me than getting, you know, any doing anything else really. So, so I guess it is what I love. And at the same time, I don't think of myself as a, you know, comedian or having real, real improv skills or anything, but I do think of it, you know, a second before normally, or, you know, a couple minutes before. And it's always kind of nerve wracking because, and still to this day, it's kind of, because I'll go, okay, I think this could be funny. I'm not going to pitch it to the director because if I say it, it's not going to be funny. If I'm like, they'll say this and I'll go, duh, duh, you know, and they'll be like, okay, you can try it, you know, whatever. It's not going to go over well. I know it'll get the best laugh if it has its, its best shot, if it's a surprise. But if it's going to be a surprise, I'm surprising my co star. I'm surprising <laughs> a crew of 100, you know, and, um, and I don't want to derail the scene and not, especially if it's not a button, but it's like in there somewhere, mm-hmm. you know? And so it gets a little, I get a little nervous. Like I'm going to spring this on everyone, you know, mm-hmm. um, but I'm going to go for it. And I don't know. I feel like you were the one that taught me like before going on a talk show to have your story prepared and like the joke, wasn't it you that like, Tom Hanks would say this and you were like, you should know what you're going to talk about on a talk show. I don't think so. I, you know, I, no, I was probably talking about how I feel insecure in it, in, in, um, at being on a talk show because it seems like all these people go up there and they do a pre-interview and then they're like, here's a funny story that happened yes. to me. And I'm like, okay. I don't have a fucking anecdote to save my life. I don't think anything funny has ever happened to me. And maybe we can have a conversation and like, you know, it'll be peppered with humor, but I always have felt uh, uh, just undergunned when it came to like stories going on a talk show. Okay, then then that was the story I'm thinking of. Like yeah. you talking about how Tom Hanks is always <laughs> so prepared, and you are not not so. Not so yeah, <laughs> but I, I like talk shows. I, I like them like after the first couple of minutes, but I'm not nervous. I don't like being nervous, but then I get comfortable, and then it's over. I'm like, I can do this for 21 minutes. I think it's one of the more intimidating mediums. Totally, same, same. I remember shooting at the Bellagio in this episode. Like, I, I kind of remember the scene at the end of the show where we're, like, on the bridge and there's, like, yeah, the gondola. Yeah. I feel like I remember that, too, yeah. I do, too. It's funny. Like, I see a moment with you and I, Adam, and we're, like, we're almost going to break. Like, I just, I don't know. I picked up on mm-hmm. it, and then we, like, kind of laugh, and we're, like, looking at each other, but, like, they kept that take in. But I catch those sometimes when I'm watching us because you would always make me laugh. And I was like, forget it. I could never stay serious. Ben, too. Ben Ben was re- really funny. He's a funny actor. And it was neat to see him, you know. Lighten up. Have so, much, <laughs> have so much fun. Yeah. I agree. I love it when Ben's like light and smiling and yeah, yeah, being yeah. funny. <laughs> well, and this this episode, obviously, this the show has a lot of melodrama and comedy. And this episode had a lot more of the the lightness to it. And, and it's... It's it's a rare moment where you see Ben's face light up and smile, and he's a funny guy in real life. So mm-hmm. you know he definitely mm-hmm. is always that hero to the rescue in every situation on this show. I take it he slept with Navi Teresa. Well, we know her name. Or- oh, right, you haven't been watching. So yeah, yeah, so yeah he, so he did. Okay, he did. He once. did yeah. sleep with her. Yeah. I ta- and I take it him and him and Marissa were on a break at that moment or something. No. Mm. Just kidding. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> yes, they were. Yes, but 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 uh, that is yeah. the only melodrama, and it was kind of a, it was a strong choice for for Teresa to actually reveal it to Marissa for the first time, and you know, and and of course, so you can't have sushi. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have alcohol. <laughs> you must be pregnant. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love. I you know what I, you know what I really appreciated. The pregnancy test in big old words across oh. the box. Oh, for that sure. And nice. then the insert, like in case you didn't know. <laughs> that was a good, that was good, that was a good Once. font choice. Yeah. So Teresa's pregnant. Whose baby is it? And the drama ensues. We never right. find yes. out either. I know people really don't want to. We? we don't. We don't. Does she have a baby? Does, does she, she have an it? abortion? Uh well, you guys don't you remember that um no. she <laughs> Well, going forward, yeah, this is a spoiler. Anybody listening, she, she, you know, Ryan goes back to Chino to be with her, be, to be responsible for the baby. She doesn't want to go back to Eddie because he hit her. Oh, he goes he back, goes back to, to right. Chino, and and Seth is like, yeah, "This yeah. sucks. I'm taking my boat to Oregon." So then you move yeah, up yeah. with Oregon. Luke, and that's when uh-huh. he. Um, <laughs> but then ultimately, she that's says, funny. I like that. <laughs> "She says that she loses the baby." 
And so Ryan's like, uh, oh, but then, but then she doesn't, I don't She remember. actually has it. She comes back lies. later. She comes back. Uh, yeah. She, she tells Ryan uh, that she lost the baby, but she didn't. Boy, our listeners are going to be like, we know better than you guys. You're right. You do. For this episode, we, we did the Vegas. <laughs> we talked about Teresa. Jimmy is looking to find a home for Marissa that she can, although I think it's strange that he's buying a home with his money. doesn't still doesn't have a job, but, um, you know, found a great place on the beach. Yeah. Things are resolved because of Ryan. Oh, because of Ryan's poker abilities. And Ben is a poker player too. I remember playing with him and doing some, mm-hmm. some, mm-hmm. um, so that that's resolved quickly, easily with Mr. Angry Trucker hat. Summer and Seth are right. back together. That felt like a real Josh Joshism, the angry trucker hat. <laughs> You're, as, uh, you know. You're that like, just, no one wears trucker hats anymore. No, just like angry trucker hats, water polo, you know what I mean? Guys, yeah. Like, he yeah. has like his it just felt like a, angry trucker hat from the inland empire. Kind uh, of you thing. know, yeah. I guess I guess the the opposite of Seth, whatever Seth's archetype is, you know. Right. Water polo and trucker hats are the opposite. <laughs> the only other scene that I found highly, highly satisfying was Sandy calling out Caleb on his shit and Jimmy coming up and clocking him for manipulating me, holding my daughter prisoner. <laughs> that was quite a punch, actually. I, uh, you really hit him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't hold back. Didn't hold back. Mm. Unrelated to the episode, I actually wanted to ask you, because we didn't do it before, but did you have like a favorite guest star that was on the show? I just remember the Valley episode, you know, and I remember like Colin Hanks and the cat, like that sticks out in my mind and that was fun. And that's such a unique, I think that was just so unique even for our show. That's such an almost different show. Mm -hmm. But um, so that stuck out. And then it's got to be Kevin Sorbo, you know, for (laughs) me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's other funny. than that, I mean, you know, we had some friends come. That's a good question. I don't know. Who are your, so who are some of your, your two's favorite? I, I remember I loved working with, uh, well, uh, everyone really. I feel like we had really cool guest stars. Chris Pratt was one of the more funny. Oh, people. Yeah. Chris I Pratt had, was I great. had a lot of fun with Chris. Yeah. He had me, I mean, hysterical. Chris, I haven't seen I haven't seen him. We did like Jennifer's body together and spent a day in Vancouver together, like, you know, a year or two after the show ended, but now well over a decade ago. But I remember one time we didn't hang out much, but we hung out a little bit. And I was at the bar coaching horses um on Sunset Boulevard that doesn't exist anymore, kind of a dive bar. And <laughs> um and I was just it was just him and I. And he and like we were just sitting in the bar and this one like scary guy, like a big older guy just like kept staring at me from like the back corner of the um, bar. And I started to get a little nervous. I'm like, dude, this guy's, this guy's really looking at me. And I don't know. He seems really kind of crazy, like intense. And he's just staring and I don't know what's going to happen. He's like, and he was very, he was in, you know, Chris is a big guy. And he's like, don't worry, man. I got your back. I'm like, all right, thanks a lot. And then the guy came up and he's like, are you on the OC? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like, all right, cool. Or whatever. That's all it was. But I still, I still remember that. I still remember thinking I was about to be attacked by a crazy man. And Chris was, was going was gonna to protect me. Yeah. I remember you, well, Olivia, obviously, wild. Uh, yeah. You had a crush on Olivia, and I was like so mad. But I had a crush on her too, so it was like, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> that sticks out in my mind. <laughs> Gary Grubbs sticks out. Do you remember the um, Gary Grubbs played Bullet, the 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 Southern Frank? billionaire? No. Yeah. Or no. Well, Bullet. I thought Bullet was. He was Bullet. No. No. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. He's a he's yeah. a famous character actor and so much fun on set. And he had eleven sons. This is whoa. This is the fourth season. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, in in the show, in the show. Yeah yeah. yeah I do oh. remember him. <laughs> I do remember him a little bit. Do you guys recognize? I don't think I know him. I've just seen him in something else. But the guy who plays the pimp in this episode, he's I only think, in the yeah. last scene. Where it's like, I recognize, I recognize him too. Him and I'm, too. Yeah, I'm trying to think what what from what he's been in that stuck in my mind. But um, yeah, I recognized him. Um, do you remember? I don't remember what he played, but Eric Balfour. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, that Eddie, actor that he plays Teresa's boyfriend. 
baby oh, dad okay. or potential baby daddy. I, I saw him at a, our kids go to the same school on a Sunday uh-huh. thing the other night. And I was like, hey, man. And I went over and said hi. And I was like, I think you're. Oh, and Navi said good. that you guys hang out with the with yeah, your kids. Yeah. yeah. So I also bumped into her at the grocery store a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> we've talked to Tate, Peter, Catherine Gallagher was a guest. And we've all discussed our versions of Camp Gallagher. And we, oh, and, and yeah. yeah, everything came, it kind of came clean um, about that. What are your recollections? I remember, what can I remember? He had a couple great, he had a great dog, and he had two, but there's one kind of like, you know, lean husky. I, I, um, I liked. <laughs> That's your memory. You're like, I remember yeah, the memory. dog. And, and um, no, and, and he had this, this great place. In fact, he had this, it's like this, you know, Connecticut like craftsman, kind of a Cape Cod-esque, I guess, home. And I remember I liked it so much that the house I ended up living in and buying, you know, Rachel, you had seen it. You were looking, you had seen it. And you're like, oh, Adam like this. You told me. And then I went and bought it. And I par- partially because on, on Gardner, partially because, you know, not because the memory was so strong, but just because I liked Peter's house so much and it reminded me of that. I think it was Fred um, Durst's house, wasn't it? It was Fred Durst's house. I still have Fred Durst's couch in my living room. Oh my gosh, that's over awesome. here. <laughs> yeah, I remember I was excited to like, not that I was like a fan, but I was like, oh, if I see him one day, I'll tell him. And then I saw him someday and told him and he didn't seem to care. I was like, all right, never mind. Um, <laughs> that was a great house. Yeah, it was a cool house. Yeah, I love the house. Um, and then uh, other Camp Gallagher, I remember, I remember, um, uh, Capture the flag, nighttime capture the flag left a big impression. That's just, that's just so such a joy. And um, you know, I mean, we were definitely stoned, if I can say that. Oh yeah, for sure. That came out. out. All right. Oh yeah. Peter kind of de- um in indicated and then Tate just like said it, you know, Tate just says anything he wants. So it was a good time. <laughs> good times. Good, good times were had. Good times. <laughs> so in this episode, when you say the Springsteen line when you were explaining why you're staying at the hard rock, did did I turn you onto Springsteen? You, you were, I remember, and I'm sure still are, a huge Springsteen. I never, I still, eh. Yeah, you were but, always uh, a little. You, but I feel I, like. I think we, I'm, sure, I'm sure we like saw him in concert. I know your dad. Your yeah. Own, my dad looks like him. And, 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 my dad's uh, a huge Springsteen. Yes. So I'm yeah, sure I dragged no, I you to a, a concert yeah, or something. Yeah, it was a big, it was and a then, big deal. Yeah. After you see him live, you kind of, you appreciate it more. I feel like you, you appreciated him more after the influence of Schwartz I, I and myself. I like some songs. I like some, you know, uh, I do like some songs, but in general, it's like too earnest for me, I guess. It's too, but, but well, that's not true. Too, not too earnest. I, I don't know. I like a lot of earnest stuff. I don't know. I like him. I like him. I'm just not Springsteen right. head. You know, I do, I do like him. I think he's cool. Springsteen um, head. Yeah. Remember him and, and uh, Radiohead, you're big into Radiohead, and, <laughs> and and I never, I liked them, and also never like fell deep into Radiohead like a lot of people. Hmm. Even though they're cool, I mean, they're 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 obviously really cool and influential, and you know, I appreciate the avant gardeness. This this article that we just read, the um, Seth Cohen is my spirit animal. The writer poses the question, quite a few questions, like would any of these things ever happened without Seth Cohen? One of them was, would Death Cab be as popular? Would they have sold out as much as right. they, without the OC? Right. It was just a question. I wonder, you know, how they feel about it. All. I know. <laughs> they <laughs> don't know? want to take credit. Right? I'm sure, I know I'm sure they're ready. To, I'm sure they're ready to move on. Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, I would think all of them, I mean, I think most, it was just a sort of fleeting moment, but Death Cab... And Seth Cohen have been, you know, kind of forever linked. And while I'm sure it's, you know, helped some ticket sales and some album sales, I also think it like, I'm sure they, you know, would have some misgivings. We actually have Ben Gibbard from Death Cab on the podcast next week. So listen and you'll find out. And you had your own band at the time. Yeah, I, I did. You know, I, I mean. You I, still do? I, Are you in a band I, now? I play drums. No, no, no. Oh. no well over a decade, but I, um, yeah, I had, I spent like the last year or two. I should have, I don't know. It was so fun. Shouldn't have, I should have not done anything differently. It was great. And I, uh, Brett was in the band. Yeah. Brett Harrison, um, big funny guy yeah. was in the band. Um, Jonah Hill well, was we, in the band. 
Giona was for like keyboards for a minute. We had yeah. a roving. It was really three of us and then a roving um, group bassist and occasional keyboardist. Um, fun thing about the show, Josh would pull from all our lives. And, you know, um, and um, so Brett Harrison, a uh, best friend of mine, was on the show. Um, uh, Volchok, my, you know, you guys know well, certainly Rachel knows very well, but my longtime agent, was my agent then, still my agent, Kevin Volchok, named a, named a, um, named one of the biggest baddies on the show after, <laughs> after him. So that's nice. Um, I don't know. That's a lot of say. personal, lot. yes. But a things. lot of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, our dogs never made a cameo. That would have been cool. Yeah, what did they not? I, I feel don't like think so. I don't know. Yeah. It was very dog heavy <laughs> on that. Yes, set. dog heavy set. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. Do you remember my pugs got into fights? I do. Molly May got into into a fight with Penny. We talked really? about this oh, once. I don't yeah, remember that. the little pug and I the thought pit Penny bull. was uh, the well um, Penny. Molly stole was what- Penny's bone and Penny went to take it back and the little bug, Molly tried to go after, like, she think, yeah, she was, she was a bitch oh, for sure. <laughs> Penny became a bitch in her older age. She was pretty good, pretty docile early on. And then later on grumpy. started, yeah. And I started to break up, break up a few fights uh-huh. really only with like, no, that's not true. Broke up a few fights with all different dogs of all different stripes. Here you go. Here's your birthday present. <laughs> That's so funny. So I, I got Rachel, uh, I really got a dog for myself that I wanted for <laughs> Rachel for her birthday. Yes. I don't know, he cried. I cried? Did I cry? <laughs> yeah. I gave it to him like, happy birthday. And he broke down in tears. Yeah. Not happy, t- not happy tears. Yeah. He brought over like Penny, who I fucking loved, but like this big pit bull, Penny. And it was named too. He was like, here's your birthday present. It's a pit bull and her name is Penny. And I, I guess I cried. And then yeah. and then you're, you're I not mean, pleased and then and then it worked out it worked out because then i got a little thurman who was, a, yeah. and who was an asshole but he was cute i don't remember i i was my only experience with him was he, he was so young he was great he was i don't cute. remember him being an asshole i heard he became an asshole he became i guess a big he didn't asshole. have me i guess he lost my <laughs> positive influence <laughs> you know you might be right you might be right <laughs> Our podcast is sponsored by Athletic Greens, the health and wellness company that makes comprehensive daily nutrition really, really simple. I like simple. I use AG1 simply because it adds to a healthy lifestyle. It's whole food based, which means absorbability and better gut health. It also supports immunity, energy, and recovery. My life is hectic. I mean, I don't have time to spend figuring out what is the most effective way to eat healthy and take tons of supplements. But with Athletic Greens, they do that for me. Busy schedules, poor sleep, exercise, the environment, work stress, or simply not eating enough of the right foods can leave us deficient in key nutritional areas. AG1 by Athletic Greens brings comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition to everybody. It's just so easy and so simple. And like I said, I mean, my days are always hectic and just having it ready for me and I know what I'm putting in my body is awesome has been such an amazing find. The first thing I do when I wake up is hydrate with electrolytes and AG1. My husband adds it to his protein shakes. It's it's also so great after a hard workout and it's very easy to travel with too. Just one scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more in one convenient daily serving. As the research changes, so does AG1. While most nutritional products that come to market never evolve, Athletic Greens continues to obsessively improve AG1 based on the latest research, producing 53 improvements over the last decade and counting. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune-supporting, free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash the OC today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash the OC to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. So, you know, Rachel, I like to do all kinds of workouts, but, you know, recently it's been alone. But you know what I was doing before the pandemic? I was actually doing Zumba classes, and I'm actually looking forward to going back to doing Zumba classes or any kind of dance class. Yeah, I mean, I would love to go to a workout class like Pilates, which is my personal favorite. See some friends, you know, I haven't seen in a while. 
And with more face-to-face interaction, oral care is of utmost importance. Right? The Quip electric toothbrush is loved by over 7 million mouths. It has timed sonic vibrations with 30-second pulses to guide a dentist-recommended two-minute clean. It's also lightweight, and the design works for both adults and kids with no wires or bulky charger to weigh you down. It's pretty fun for kids. I mean, you can upgrade your Quip with a new smart motor to track and improve your brushing with the free Quip app. Then you can earn amazing rewards like free refills, products, Target gift cards, hello, and more. You know, Briar recently had three fillings done. This child, I cannot, I cannot keep her out of the dentist chair, but now I think I can. I am getting her to use Quip and plus with all the rewards. I mean, the girl loves Target too, I'm not gonna lie. So this is a very good motivator. <laughs> Beyond the brush, Quip has everything you need to build a complete routine. They have two types of floss, floss string that expands to clean and a reusable floss pick that replaces over 180 disposable picks with every refill. Add to that their anti-cavity toothpaste and their refillable mouthwash, and you've got all you need for the perfect smile. Do you know what I like about Quip? The simplicity of it. It's sleek, stylish, minimalistic, no cords. It's well-made, and it has become the perfect travel brush. If you go to getquip.com slash OC right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash OC, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash OC. Quip, the good habits company. I have a question for you. What are your thoughts on fame in general and what you guys, Hmm. the four of you, the core four of you really experienced? And it was, it was pretty quick and it doesn't always happen with a show. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've said it a lot. Sure you have too, Rachel, but like, it's such a different time. It just doesn't feel any way like being famous would be now. You know, it just like, I don't know, we were in Manhattan Beach in a parking lot and like hanging out as a group that mostly like existed around the show. And so I just didn't feel, you know, it wasn't like you're online and you're exposed to millions of people. Yeah, no, Instagram is like a way different world. Felt so insulated. So I didn't. And while I was young, I was 23. I'd been doing it for, you know, a handful of years and been on TV for a minute too. Not, not famous, but like, I felt oddly like a veteran at that moment. And, and so I, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I I don't think it, I don't want to sound too blase about it. It was, it was cool. It was, it was also very exciting. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a horrible thing to deal with. It was awesome. You know, a lot of opportunities and we're talking about these houses we bought so young. I know. Go buy a house. I mean, what the what the hell? Like, amazing. I've said, though, this on the show and whatever that, like, going through it together, you know, us kids and you and I in particular, obviously, um, I think helped a lot because we were... Absolutely. That, yeah, that support. And we were also a little more domesticated, so we weren't, like, falling totally. out of cars and whatnot. Abs- abs- absolutely. Which played into it. Mm-hmm. No, hundred percent. I was, yeah. uh, I felt, you know, and still do look back and go like, no, pretty grounded, stay pretty grounded there. You know, obviously certain things I do differently. And I think that, you know, was I a, as appreciated and Rachel and I have talked about this briefly, even on our plane ride and, you know, <laughs> like was, was I, and was some of the quote unquote kids like as appreciative of the show, you know, as we, sh- at the time, as we could have been or should have been, you know, probably not, but but um, but still, but still, I I think it was um, mostly a very positive experience. Even the fame was a thrill, and you know, I don't know, it's got its drawbacks, but it's it's been worth it. When we spoke with Mick G, he made it a, a um, interesting observation. He was saying, of course, like you said, there's there was no social media then when it came to. TV stars or teen heartthrobs or just fame in general, it was kind of a smaller world. And, you know, you have publicists telling you, go out to this red carpet to get your picture taken, to get into magazines. You almost had to seek it out. So if you didn't, if you weren't doing that, you were kind of isolated. And now anybody can kind of get famous if they do something you know, worthy enough or, or even just worthy of looking at a picture on Instagram or YouTube. So it's kind of big now, I guess. And in some ways, 
it was, there were very, there were less of, there were less people like you guys. There was, you know what I mean? So there was more, there's less outlets. Yeah. 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 So there's more attention on a show like the OC and becoming, you know, like Misha was that it girl who was highly in demand and probably had a lot of, you know, constantly go to this, go to this party, go to this party and Mm -hmm. work all the time. So it's, it's Mm -hmm. gotta be some very overwhelming for me. I was, I was heading home to my three-year-old and, Mm -hmm. and it was just a very easy, easy, probably one of the easiest jobs and most enjoyable jobs for me. Well, Brody, do you remember, like the set was a pretty like friendly play. Like, I feel like I only have positive Memories. Me too. I do not feel, I don't have a single memory of feeling overwhelmed, like, oh man, the fame, the world, the attention. You know, I, I remember one time, like maybe the craziest thing, this wasn't even that insane, but it was like, Jesus, we went to my parents' house in San Diego and like some photographers followed us all the way there. And that was pretty surreal to be in San Diego, an old suburb, and like there's some creeps car out front. But that was about it. And, and, um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, again, we were like so domesticated and it was so insular and I mean, were there less famous people at the time? I, yeah. But in some ways, maybe even that made me feel secure. Cause it was like, Ooh, got a lock on this job. I don't know. Now it feels like a little bit more of a meritocracy where I'm like, you know, you can, there's not the gatekeepers anymore. You don't have to, you know, it, it's not that anyone, there are gatekeepers and it's hard to break in, but like viral people can go viral now. There mm-hmm. are, you know, several ways. Um, and so not that like, I mean, the fame wasn't bad, but what I wanted to do was act and, you know, mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. a lot of people see it. It wasn't like, I wouldn't have been happy being a YouTube. I don't know, <laughs> creating content or whatever, but, but, but I just, um, honestly, like I, and I think Rachel feels the same way. Like I can look back and say, no, pretty breezy. And, and your life doesn't sound too dissimilar from mine and our life at the time. Right. I mean, it's, it, and I, look, I, I like to be truthful from, from Mike and, and speaking from my experience. I can only speak from my experience, but we've learned and, you know, just, we don't have to get into this, but, you know, for I can be standing next to someone, for instance, like Misha has said that her experience was completely different than mine. Mm -hmm. And she was standing Mm -hmm. there right next to me saying that it was a drama filled Mm -hmm. experience for her, which is. Did you see that, Adam, like what she had said, what Misha was saying or no? No, what she said. Apparently it was, she didn't feel it was a safe environment for her. And I'm never going to negate anybody's experience, but I can only imagine at 17, 18 years old, the amount of pressure that was put on her and, and that she's come out of it now. And and her narrative is that it was not a very good experience for her, which is somewhat heartbreaking. But at that, in the early two thousands, we have learned if you are a person in the spotlight and someone like her, it was, it was, I guess, I guess it wasn't the best experience for her. That's, that's what she's, she's expressed. I mean, I think that in general, and certainly even more so 20 years ago, although modern, the modern age has its problems too, but in new problems, but, um, I don't think a set, you know, she was like 17 when we started. I don't think that is a very, I mean, I think we're all nice people that treated her nicely. I, I, I feel pretty good about my behavior with her, but, um, but I don't think it is a protective environment. And I don't think like, I don't think any of us were particularly protected. It's just that, you know, I think we had some ground, some solid grounding and some solid support, uh, in our personal lives and, and, and I, the way we were raised and, you know, and, um, and we're all older too. Um, not that age has the only, the only thing that has to do with it, but, um, yeah, not even to single out our set. I just think like, it's not designed to like really protect you at all. And you could argue it's designed to exploit you, you know? And, you know, I'm sympathetic. I'm sympathetic to her, her, I didn't think it was a drama filled set, but I'm sympathetic to her, her, her experience certainly. And I will say, I don't think the way she was let go, killed or whatever was the best. Mm-hmm. And I mean it from a story perspective, but I also mean it for the psyche of a person that age. Like it, 
it it seemed to the narrative let it be known that like yes she was we ran out of story ideas but maybe she was a problem you know like it just like that narrative really took hold mm-hmm. and my opinion even though she wasn't the main person I'm working was working with was you know while she had some growing up to do and 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 had some moments like I actually found her pretty easy to work like 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 not I don't know again I didn't know her that well but like definitely not a monster you know what I mean like definitely not and and yeah you guys were the more like definitely not and so I feel like that's a young very public thing to be essentially fired like that to have a rumor or innuendo or whatever the narrative kind of be because your behavior is so bad Mm -hmm. and I just think a, that's not exactly true to my, I'm just, yeah, I'm just speculating, but I feel like it wasn't a hundred percent behavior. And if it's not, I don't know, could it have been handled differently? I think so, but everyone was young involved and right. it's a literally different time. But I do think in terms of like some of the reassessing we're doing of like, just that narrative, of like shitting on young women in general, just mm-hmm. talking about Britney Spears, talking about Lindsay Lohan, talking about all these people who went through something at a very young age, women particularly, that were just mercilessly made fun of in public by grownups. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like I put her in that category and I, I feel like couldn't have felt good. It probably felt horrible, especially the aftermath, you know, more than, more than the set, I feel like, in any drama that's going on on set, I'm sure what really hurt was the preceding year or two. Absolutely. Yeah, I, would, I agree. I would at, agree with that. At, with everything you're saying, how the, they, they, the, you know, you're being told by your representatives, go out to these events and the paparazzi wants to take pictures of you. And this is, you're doing this for your career. And yet they're going to tear you down at the same time. But I think what I take from it is, like you said, it's, it's a cautionary tale for young people and parents getting their kids into this industry. And it's, you know, especially I had, I had, do you guys remember the director, Michael Fresco? I think I've said this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was, he was, he was a director many times on the show. I remember. He said, I don't like to work with children. It feels like child abuse because I have to tell them stop fucking around and you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. do your dialogue. Mm-hmm. And these are, these are kids that are supposed to be out enjoying life and, and being with their peers and they're, they have to grow up so quickly. But, but, um, well, yeah. I agree with everything you're saying that, um, I, I had a lovely time working with her. I don't know how she was feeling about the show at the time. So it's, um, but like I said, I think it's a cautionary tale. She was like so seasoned at like 16. Yeah. She'd be uh-huh. like, can you show me uh-huh. like how tight you are? And de- like, she just like knew yeah, all these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. I like walk onto my first set and there's like a 16 year old who's like teaching me everything. Yeah. And I was like, Jesus, like that's gotta be crazy to be that young and that seasoned and like professional and just kind of knowing all that. Uh-huh. And I wonder, you know, that to me seems like something to, you can get through it it seems like something to transcend more than something to like strive for mm-hmm. or that mm-hmm. really launches, you know, you know, I've, I've thought, you know, I have kids and I've obviously, you know, you guys have kids and it's like, are they going to be actors? Do they want to be actors? What do I think about this? You know, right. and I obviously I'm coming at it from a very privileged position for starters of like financially secure and like have contact. So at any point could probably, and I, and I just think like, yeah, to do it before you're 18 seems professionally, it seems like something to get through, not something that's going to, oh, thank God I was a famous actor at 15 or this no. wouldn't be happening at 30. You know, yeah. like, doesn't seem like, you know, seems like anything you can do at 30, you can do without having been famous at 15. My mm-hmm. parents were like, you can't do this until you're 18. You know, I just wanted to say one thing. We had Tate on and I don't know if you have listened to the podcast or, or whatnot, but I've listened, but not that episode. No. Okay. So he actually did say that, you know, it's so funny. You go on these shows, like watch what happened, happens live. And, and they really, this is a world of like, they want you to just say anything. And, 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 and Tate did admit 
Um, actually, Rachel brought it up, but but Tate said, I think mm-hmm. I said some things that landed rather poorly. And, I, and we were like, okay, let the healing begin. Because he had made a comment about the kids having bad attitudes when he was directing, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and I, mm-hmm. essentially that was his, um, his healing apology. <laughs> Do you remember that? I do remember because I did that show and that I didn't, I'd never seen that show. I didn't know what a, a big deal it was. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, didn't they ask you about show. like kissing me or so, I saw some quote or like kissing Olivia. They, I don't know. They asked, I mean, they asked serious dirt They're, They just want you to. They, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They asked like, you know, they took a, who's, they took a poll. Who's better looking at a Mar- or Ben and who's, you know, Who and, won? um, who's, who's a better kisser. And, yeah. and then they're like, here's a clip of Tate talking some shit about <laughs> and then play it. And like, what do you say to that? You know, what I, mean? I was like, I was pretty like, I was also like maybe a little bit drunk on it. Cause, um, <laughs> um, they, it's like a real party vibe. And I had come from like, I think a premiere already. And I don't know. It was just like, and so I was pretty loose and I, I don't know. I was just like, I was over it in a nice, like I thought the Andy Cohen was nice. And yet I actually didn't appreciate it. I was like, this is fucking gross mm-hmm. for me, actually. And, and I'm a little annoyed that I didn't know that this is the setup. Like, oh, they just bombard you with a bunch of yeah. gossip and you got to, you know. And so I don't know. I think I acted a little over it. But anyways, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Tate's quote made me laugh, but I don't know. I'm sure Ben... Ben has said he talked to him and they're good and we're good. I'm sure I'd like to see, I'd like to see him just so, you know, we can be good. But I, I was, I was annoyed at the quote, but, but I don't care. I'm happy. I'm happy. He doesn't feel great about it. And I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't give a shit about the quote. I'm happy. And, and not him. He's, I, I had a lot of fun with him, you know, maybe not that one episode he directed, but, but other than that, <laughs> like, other than that, like, I actually love the guy. Like we had, we, we, um, I, um, you know, I, I, uh, I remember really liking him and, and I haven't seen him since, honestly, I haven't seen wow. him since the show wrap. Yeah. We were going to get together at Peter's a couple summers ago. Remember mm-hmm. I put you all in a group mm-hmm. chat and that didn't work out, but, but, you know, Tate just, t- he, Tate tells stories with this glint in his eye and humor but it does, mm-hmm. but it, but it still comes off as you know. He says knuckleheads or bad attitude or whatever he said. I can totally, totally see how that's like. What? Why are you yeah. saying this, son? You know. Yeah. So I remember. I mean, fuck it. Let's get into it. I remember, <laughs> and Rachel and I had this little thing. It was he was directing, and my feeling, and I think our disagreement. It's almost the last time we've talked, and but like our disagreement was. You know, you have directors come in and then you start to like know your character and you start to know like what you want to do with it. You kind of direct yourself a little bit on a fourth season of the show. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, as I was starting to admittedly like not like it as much, not like the stories as much and kind of like shell up a little bit, you know, clam up a little bit and go like, I'm going to I'm not going to go out on a limb for all this. I'm going to stay in my comfort zone. And he was directing and it was his first time directing. And, um, um, and, uh, I was like, my recollection is going like, oh, I'm going to do much more than I would do. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to help. I'm going to help. I'm not going to be, you know, and, and, and let me say, I also think I had a good, good relationship with all our directors. Like, I think I like, I like them and I think they liked me. I don't, I don't think they were like rolling their eyes at me, but maybe, but my recollection was, I was like, I'm going to, he's my friend. I'm going to, I'm going to help. And he wanted me to do, and he asked me to do one thing. And I was like, I don't know. I don't think I would. And then he got pretty pissed. And then that was kind of all I remember. And I'm sure he would say that like, I was being ridiculous and in high, and, and my recollection is still what it is, is I was like, I was pretty helpful. I just wasn't going to do a certain thing, but I was nice about it. And I was, you know, and I don't know, but honestly, who cares? Loved, I would love to see him again and love to see him again and, 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 and be past it. I mean, I also, also was pretty bad. Like in this last season, it was like, it became like, okay, I'm just going to read my part. And also it's a game. Let's see how little I can know and do it, which is not professional. No, let's just say <laughs> you, were, not you were pretty much over it by the fourth season. I, mean, I was, I was. And, and I, and I, I, you know, if I have a regret and I do, it's being disrespectful in that way. It's like, 
in any way. I mean, whatever. I, I can compartmentalize and I can economize and get through my day however I deem fit. And, you know, but, but I'm okay with that. But in any way, and there were ways that I let my lack of, you know, affection for the material bleed out and let it be known. That's gross. It didn't need to do that. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I didn't, I could have kept that to myself more. Um, I didn't belittle anyone and I don't feel like I treated anyone rudely mm -hmm. or, you know, but I definitely treated the work disrespectfully at a certain point. And by doing, by extension, that's other people's work too. And so that is being disrespectful to them. But these are all learning things that we're supposed to do at your age. I mean, I, I remember being on a series, not a successful series at 25, and I could not wait to get off of this show and for it to end. Not that this was, I'm saying that was this, uh -huh. but, but I think when, when we're young, it's, 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 uh, I think we're supposed to try and figure out like becoming, being subjective, being self-critical constantly, and uh -huh. then saying, wait, maybe I didn't need to react that way. Maybe I'm, it's not even a mistake or, or something wrong. It's like, I'm going to go forward and maybe approach something in a different way because maybe that didn't work out Absolutely. so well. I mean, I remember I wasn't, sometimes it was funny. I didn't like some of the storylines personally. I'm like, what? I have to live in a trailer? Great storyline. What? I have to have a porno from my past come out? Really uncomfortable having to shoot that scene. But it ended up being a really, uh, you know, well-received storyline. You know, sometimes we put our personal things into it and ultimately it comes out just fine on screen. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've left I left there being mostly friends with everyone. So yeah. I feel, you know, yeah. Pretty good. But again, yeah, I would do I would do some things differently. I think your last quote to the crew though, when you wrapped Adam, I don't know if you remember saying oh, no. that. I certainly don't, but I'm sure it was charming <laughs> and no, I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> you said, Well, it's been lucrative. <laughs> oh my <Yeah>. god. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're here now to clear, clearing Jesus. everything up. <laughs> you know. Did I really? I mean, it's kind of funny. <laughs> it is very funny. I think funny. you did mean it. I think you were being funny. Yes. Is it a little, you know. But again, it's so, it's so, <laughs> it's so insulting. And, and God, wow. What a little shit. Um, I also didn't have any appreciation for you know, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a, I was already like, it was all of a sudden we we're making more than my wildest dreams. And I was like, money, I don't even count it, whatever. I don't like, <laughs> and everyone else is like, you know, you're, you're, you're not kids, but you're in your twenties, you know, families. And then this whole crew is like fucking great. I have my, I'm paying off my house. I've got my kids in school, you know, not everyone else, but like most people are, you know, this is, their nest egg and this is and and I didn't have the appreciation for that mm -hmm. you know that like everyone's different you know I like like I said this is very young and yeah. financially unconcerned and meanwhile everyone's like you know not everyone but it's also like there's art but it's also commerce and it's mm -hmm. like there's a good job for everyone yeah. you know and 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 I I hardly if ever took that into account right in a way that I certainly do now right but now you you know, recognize it. And we're different people. You grow up and you're appreciative and everything else. And I think that's awesome because it was a really great time, I think, in all of our lives. And it's pretty surreal to look back on it and reflect on it. And also like, you know, we've been working since and you see how rare I wasn't, you know, I've been working a lot longer post that show than I was mm -hmm. pre that show. Mm -hmm. And you realize like, how rare it is to have lightning in a bottle, how rare it is to make something special and to have it hit and to have many people watch and enjoy it. And I wish I could say that I'm such a self-contained artist and I'm so, so about the work that I'll do it in the woods. I don't care, you know, who sees it, but I very much do, you know, I like, it's, you want to be appreciated and enjoyed, you know, the stuff you make. And it's a very good feeling and it's a high all its own. And like, it's rare. And I realize that now, you know, how rare to, and, and so it's very um, satisfying and exciting to like have this show and this character forever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's like a real success and career high and like, you know, something that like, 
I don't know. I'll always, I'll always be happy about, it, even if, you know, I find it myself hard to watch it. I did watch the episode and go like, I can watch another. I'm going to see what <laughs> happens next. But, uh, you know, myself is a little more hard to take, but I, that said, I'm grateful for the time capsule of it too. You know? Yeah, absolutely. If you're willing for a few more minutes, we had some voicemails for you. If you're okay. I love it. I got it. Hello. My name is Patrick Rush and I believe I was the casting director on the OC. I'm old, so I might be wrong about that. But I was just wondering, Adam Brody, what gave you the courage when you were set up to read for Seth to come into my office and decide to read for Ryan first? (laughs) I love that you did it. And I love that I was right. You know, I have to be honest, I don't remember doing that. (laughs) I suppose it was not courage, but insecurity and ego are so close. You know, it's hard to say what's what, but I was probably, I don't don't remember that, but I was probably going, you know, no, no, I'm cool. (laughs) I'm not... (laughs) I'm going to be, I don't have to be this, you know, this guy that nobody talks to. Um, I can be this guy. Um, I, I guess, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that's why, because um, it's not like the brooding dialogue versus lighter or wordier stuff would have appealed to me more. I'd certainly rather have a mouthful to say, but, but I must've felt like affronted that I was, you know, put into such a, such a geeky category, even though, Clearly, I should have been, and I'm happy he was right. I do remember reading with Ben, like t- he already had the part, and testing with him, and that felt like like in the room, and that felt like a slam dunk. It was very good and very natural, and I liked him. I, I was so happy they cast. I was like, oh, this is great. He's a he's a real actor, and um, you know, I, I so we hit it off instantly, and I remember feeling good about that. That's awesome. He, he, he was our second guest and he told us that story and he said, yeah, you were supposed to read for Seth. Then he read for Ryan and I sent him away and had him come back from Seth for Seth. So <laughs> I, this is ringing a bell. I mean, it, 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 it sounds right and it's ringing a bell, but I, you know, I, I know, I, you know, I remember being hesitant with the pilot the whole time. Not, you know, um, because it was so serious and mostly because I was 23 and I'm like, mm, mm. high school show and they keep you high school forever. That was my big hang up. Mm. Yeah. And initially Doug Lyman wasn't attached and, you know, talking about Vince Vaughn, like I was such a swingers fan and he had done go and born identity at that point. So Doug Lyman was my favorite director. And then he came to do the pilot. I was like, okay, all right, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I want to do it. And, um, yeah, so it doesn't surprise me that I was like, I could take or leave it. I don't know. I'm not going to read for that. Maybe I'll be for this. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, shows your confidence. I mean, that was, you know, that's not <laughs> a, like, that's no, not a normal thing <laughs> that you walk into a casting director and say, by the way, I'm reading for this role. <laughs> right. I don't know how. I don't know how like blunt I was. You know, I don't know if <laughs> I, I bet you were but, pretty blunt. If I had to guess, yeah. I guess if I if I closed it by, it's been lucrative. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> it guess. Works for you. I, Jesus. That is, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like some, I mean, that yeah. sounds so awful, but. No, it's good. I like that it's kind of funny, I guess. Wait, the, on that note, because I wanted to say this, before I knew you, a comment you made to me on the set, before I knew you, you know, and ha- your humor can be a little like dickish. <laughs> you were like, <laughs> well, and I, I didn't know something about what we were shooting or whatever. And you were like, well, you're just lower on the totem pole than I am. Or like you made yeah. a totem pole comment and I was like, what a fucking dick. But that was just I'm you okay. being you and you were joking, but I didn't yeah. know that. And I was like, yeah. Jesus. I'm, I'm more okay with that one. L- oh, lucrative thanks a lot. Sound, lucrative sounds bad. Well, I was obviously joking in both. But I, know, like, I don't know. Saying it to a crew sounds insane. Yeah. But um, you can take it. I can. That's yeah. true. What's up, Brody? It's Leah. How you doing? <laughs> Um, I just was thinking of a funny memory, um, which was Leah? that somehow you convinced us all that we needed to watch a Steven Seagal film one night. It's a good I time. believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was called A Time to Kill. 
Right, and kill. Time to kill Matthew McConaughey. For yeah. some reason, <laughs> like, since that point in time, that movie has come up in my life. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. And people are always like, huh, you've seen that? <laughs> and yeah, I've seen that because we all sat around the TV together and you made us watch it. I don't know if you remember <laughs> that, but... <laughs> It's quite a strange, well, funny memory of mine. <laughs> how rad to hear Leah's <laughs> voice. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Haven't seen her, you know. Yeah. Leah is one of my years. oldest, bestest friends. Yeah. This oh is your God. life, Adam um, Brody. <laughs> I guess that's not true. I did see her. I saw her after the show wrapped. I was friends for a while with somebody who was dating her. Wasn't it Over the Top? Why do I feel like a movie called Over the Top? Over was- the Top would be a Sylvester Stallone arm wrestling movie. Um, Hard to Kill, Steven Seagal's, like, I haven't revisited these movies in a long time, but I grew up loving Steven Seagal and Van Damme and stuff. And Steven Seagal's funny because his thing was just, like, snapping people's wrists. That was, like, a signature (laughs) move. It's, like, breaking a wrist so, like, the bone pops out of the skin. And uh, that's about as much as I remember of it. But I'm, I'm sure those movies hold up in a entertainment value way. Hi, Adam. This is your favorite OC makeup artist. No, it's not Joni Powell. It's Cindy Miggins. Uh, <laughs> How are you? Oh my, oh, my goodness. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of everybody from the show. I can't believe what an iconic show we all worked on. Um, it's so incredible. I wanted to leave a couple of comments and ask you a couple of questions, I guess. It's my, with my request from Mindy and Rachel. But um, first of all, I want you to know that back in the day, you gave me uh, your set jacket when we wrapped the Seth Cohen, Seth jacket. (laughs) And just to let you know, I still wear it today when I'm on set. And I always think of you and everyone always asks me what, who is Seth? And I have to tell (laughs) the story and it's really cool. And I feel cool wearing it still. Um, is it weird that I still have it after 20 years? Who cares? (laughs) But anyway, um, also my question to you is who was your favorite guest star and do you miss Captain Oates? And just to let you know, um, I did, um, I did love my favorite episode was the Spider-Man episode. I thought you were such a trooper hanging, hanging upside down. Um, it was pretty remarkable. And I hope you know how special you are all the whole entire cast really. But you guys just made this show incredible to work with. Um, the cast and crew was amazing and still my favorite cast of all time. Aww. I really miss you. Um, do you remember us working together on Mr. and Mrs. Smith? I got to beat you up. And um, I also actually worked with Layton. I did a test for her on Gossip Girls when uh, with Josh. But wow. anyway, all right, kid. I miss you. I hope life is treating you well. I'm very proud of you. I can't believe you're a dad of two. And I, uh, one day, hopefully, we could all have a reunion or, you know, maybe a, re- a reboot. You know how Hollywood loves a good <laughs> reboot. But um, all right. I hope you're good. Take care. All the best to you. Best wishes. Love you guys. Oh, my gosh. Aww. I love her. That is so great. We were so tight. I mean, mm-hmm. you know. Like your makeup person, (laughs) especially on a show, but on anything really as an actor, like it's your number one, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the person you actually work with the most. Um, (laughs) And you're like this um, this close all the time, face to face. (laughs) Yeah. You start your day with them, you end your day with them and a lot in between. Um, I love her. I haven't seen her since the show, but um, well, hopefully she listens to this. I love you. And um, I'm so happy she wears a jacket. That's, that's, so adorable and makes me happy um i also remember because speaking of like 16 millimeter and stuff how much fucking makeup i know you know the amount the amount that would get painted on that they just don't do anymore um you don't need to with digital but um oh my gosh there's an other era of Mm -hmm. just just face paint and i don't miss that but i miss her (laughs) that's great Cindy's the best. We love she our Cindy. She is the best. And she, she was mine, Mindy, and Adams, all of us. She did uh-huh. all three of us. So, Hi, Adam. It's Olivia. Um, okay. A couple questions that I feel are extremely important for people to know. One, 
I've been curious about for Olivia. Years, I'm like, who? Oh, but Olivia. Do you <laughs> still read the newspaper every morning? And do you still start every day with a bagel? <laughs> okay, those are the two most important questions. And then also, do you still see every movie that comes out? Oh. I always found that fascinating about you. Um, I feel like you were an encyclopedia of film. And I'm very really curious if you've kept that up. And especially during the pandemic, do you still feel the same urge to see all the movies? Or was it about the experience and the theater and the popcorn and all that? Or is it the actual movies? Um Olivia, I've seen the most actually. I haven't seen her in a couple of years now, but like. Yeah, um, Olivia's another best friend of mine, everyone. Yeah, we have kids the same age and we're hanging out with some people in common. And so I've, I've seen her from time to time over the last five years. Um, um, well, I don't read the newspaper anymore, but I, you know, read the, I mean, like on print. I, I got so much reading done on the OC. I loved it. So much reading. You did. Um, um, <laughs> it, that was so fun. Uh, I don't do that. Now I'm just on my phone and like I'm reading, but so much of it's Twitter and it doesn't feel, it's hardly ever a novel at set on set anymore. And then I did, did it all. It was great. Um, you would make uh, us go get a bagel every single morning. Like we never could go out to breakfast. You had to have a bagel in your coffee <laughs> at your coffee place. <laughs> For a long time after too, like I, honestly, until I was married, I didn't even like toast a bagel at my house or know how to make coffee. I was just like, I'll just go to a coffee shop every morning. And it was a little embarrassed because it was like, it became Seth Cohen's thing. And I'm like, you know, not that anyone really knew, but I was just like, I need a bagel. I'll, you know, I'll go do this publicly every day. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, I've mixed it up just for health reasons. You know, like I, I still love a bagel, but I um, try to do a little more, get a little more protein in there in the morning, mix it up. Plus I'm making food for kids and mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, um, so it's not religiously that. And as for movies, I, um, when I moved to LA to like become an actor at more or less 20, I, I like just got into it. And so I just really a little obsessively, like I loved movies, but I wanted to see everyone. And, and I still have that feeling, but like as a parent, you just can't, or, you know, I mean, I certainly can't now half of what I watch, if not more is kid stuff. And, um, now it's like, there's those ones I want to see, but also movies have shifted to TV. Like adult fare has gone to television a lot more too. And, and, and that's a bigger commitment. It's harder for me to go like, I'll just try this for 10 hours. Like I don't watch that much, you know, I don't binge that, that much either, but you know, I got those 45 to an hour minutes before bedtime every night and I, uh, we watch something. But no, but to answer Olivia's question, no, I wish, and I still want to, but I do not obsessively watch every movie. Um, <laughs> it was so fun. I love that, doing that and <laughs> that time in my life and like going to like late night, you know, arc light stuff. I heard that you, your thing. that you've been watching a lot of kids' movies and you've recently become a fan of Sound of Music. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so wonderful. It's the best. I know, right? It's like, I mean, that is an epic, that's just a movie. Yeah. That's just like, I can't say enough good things about it and how epic it is and how I, I um, oh, I love it. It's been so nice having a daughter, you know, because I didn't grow up with any girls. And so mm -hmm. it's interesting, just that, that whole world of media and that, that, you know, more female centric stories and the mm -hmm. kind of archetype. It's like, it's interesting. It seems like the girl is always lost and like, you know, it's always Wizard of Oz and you got to get home and there's bad people wanting to take advantage. Whereas the guy's always imbued with some power, you know, and he has to go fight and the boy, um, sword in the stone or whatever. And, um, I don't know. I'm enjoying the less violent, you know, I mean, the violent aspect of, uh, uh, the, the more of the girl stories. And I'm, um, not that they have to be sexualized, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very conscious now having a son of like wanting to, you know, I don't know, get the, get the guns out of the picture. Right. Protective. Having a daughter can change a perspective completely. Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. for dads. Totally. Yeah. Hi, I have a, uh, a question for Mr. Brody, Adam. It's, it's Josh Schwartz, uh, long, long time fan. And uh, just just wanted to call in with a couple questions. First of all, um, I submitted a photo to Rachel of a um, 
photo shoot we did with a, a famous uh, playmate slash actress. Um, and I was just wondering if you could uh, set the narrative of what's going on in that photo and how we all felt about uh, shooting that picture that day. Uh, and secondly, I have a question about um, if you could at all talk about the, the outsized role that Mark McGrath played in all of our lives early on in the show's run um, and him taking you under his wing and, and uh, the fact that uh, your agent, Volchuk, lived next door to Mark McGrath and we all toilet papered his house and just, you know, what that was oh. like. Thanks. <laughs> good polls. These are good polls. I sent um, you, I sent you a link to the photo that he's Yeah, I remember the photo. <laughs> um, wow. We should probably so describe funny. what the photo is yeah. for the listeners. The what we're looking at here. Chris Carmack, myself, Schwartz, and then inexplicably Brett Harrison, my <laughs> friend who became Josh's friend. Um, and we're tied up and we have our names. And then Pamela Anderson, who's scantily clad, to say the least, is has a gun and she's picking a name out of the hat. And it looks like she's picked mine. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's a real like, um, got a real 80s raunchy sex comedy feel. <laughs> I think it was um, Dave LaChapelle like shot it, right? Or Oh, I don't remember. No, you know who shot it? It's McChee. What? I thought it yeah. said it was credited. Oh, it was McG that it? shot it? I don't know. I think McG shot it, yeah. Okay, um, just kidding. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, that's the narrative, I guess. That's the backstory, a lot going on in that. And um, yeah, I don't know. I remember it's not like we had anything to offer Pamela Anderson or to talk about, you know. So I'm sure she, she seemed nice and I don't re- rem- remember really speaking to her. <laughs> um, I mean, hella pleasantries, but like, you know, we didn't get into it and, uh, uh, ridiculous. Just one of those ridiculous, you know, especially that first year, you know, when you're in, cause that was the first year for sure. And it's like, you're on a show and all of a sudden you're, yeah, you're famous as we're talking about. And the most random opportunities, you know, come and you go, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, and, um, that's just one of those just kind of inexplicable, but, um, but, um, it is funny. And I do, I will always remember that. That was very sad. And the, and Mark McGrath, (laughs) you know, I didn't remember keeping it till right now, but that, (laughs) that is, I'm happy we did that. I like Mark. I haven't seen him in, you know, 15 years, but he was a good friend of McGee's. Ben and I, this is another one of those, like, I guess let's just do it. We were, you know, there's like, they probably still have it, but there's a celebrity basketball league. And, um, and there certainly wasn't the time. I bet they still have it. And you get like, where, you know, just a bunch of celebrities play basketball in a very official, like in official gear. Like, I think we were the Charlotte Hornets and you get like NBA jerseys and shorts and clothes. And we never practiced, but, um, McGrath was on the team and he was good. And Bill Bellamy was on the team. And, um, I don't know. I just remember Mark being real nice and uh, real, real, real nice to us. And uh, uh, I sucked at, you know, at basketball. Um, <laughs> um, I was, I didn't offer anything. Ben wasn't so hot either, but, um, but yeah, we were on a basketball team with him. Um, so stupid. And, uh, and he was rad. I remem- remember in the beginning because Mick G, we would have parties at his house and Mark would be there. Mark mm-hmm. was at all the, the OC parties. And now that just rang rang a bell. We'd go to Kevin's from time to time. He was up there in the Hills Mm -hmm. and Mark was, and we'd go there for after parties. I guess right. Mark was, He he would live right next door. Yeah. Yeah. They all lived above sunset. My agent, Kevin was neighbors with Mark, which I completely forgot about. And then Mick G had a great, you know, great house. (laughs) Um, And um, yeah. Yeah, those were that was a good year. That was an ex- I mean, that was very exciting. That was just exciting to all of a sudden be doing that stuff. Right. That picture is those so funny. Times. Have you guys? That picture is so stupid, but <laughs> I love it. But why Brett is there is so funny. It's like OC and then this guy. And then Brett. He's, Maybe he's Ben wouldn't do it. Or wait, is Ben in it? No. No, he's not in it. I wonder. I wonder. Probably not. Well, Brett had been big funny guy on the episode. But I don't know if he was even there at that point. Okay. If he had done that at that point. Okay. I feel like he hadn't even done it yet. But I don't know. Playboy. You know, you got you to gotta be in Playboy. You got to be in Playboy. You, got, you got. 
Do you ever have that moment where you're like, God, what I do for a living yeah. is kind of surreal? I do. I do. I, I, I do all the time. And it's funny getting older and doing the same thing <laughs> and going like, wow, it's, everyone's getting younger around me and I'm still doing the same thing. I'm grinding it out and getting some make. It's like a, I didn't appreciate at the time how physical a job what we do mm-hmm. is. Not obviously the photo, the Playboy photo shoots, mm-hmm. but the, uh, that's physical too. But I mean, like truly like being on set for 14 hours is I get, you know, you get older and, and the food seems to get worse and <laughs> so on and so forth. Hi, this is Volchok. I've got a question for you, Adam. Oh, God. Did you find it weird <laughs> that your mother was only 14 years older than you? Oh, hmm. huh. yeah. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing about television. It should probably change. But um, I mean, I guess it's the conundrum when, you know, Kelly was the real, could be the real life of a high school kid. I mean, you know, you're on the young side. Melinda, you're going to be on the young side to have a high school kid then. But at the same time, you want to do a high school show, but you want those little fuckers to work 14 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> it's hard to get 16 year olds to do that. And you, you want them chiseled. So you're going to hire. <laughs> You're going to hire people in their 20s. And then, you know, do you age up the parents? What do you do? And it being TV, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was funny to me then. And it's only gotten funnier. I feel like you and Kelly had like a thing. Not a thing, not a real thing, but like... Ben and I would both flirt with Kelly a lot. Yeah, if I, and I, if I'm not mistaken, Kelly... I don't know if she told me or who. No, she, she said, like, she said that I mean, we were talking about how a lot of, you know, the Ryan character was set up to be the heartthrob, but everyone was crushing on, on, on Adam. Yeah. Kelly had a crush on you. Ah. Another <laughs> girl. I was like, God, take her down too. I mean, I, they were yeah, all lined yeah. up. <laughs> I think it's in a mother and son, there should mm. be some, <laughs> some Oedipal, strong Oedipal feelings. Yeah. Well, Adam Brody, that was, that was it. We've had right so much well, fun here talking. Wait, and Brody, I want to show you this picture I found. Sorry, I know. I'm Go for it. <laughs> Do you remember? Okay, is it pixelated? It's so pixelated, but I see that's it's so pixelated. I see, it looks like I have a goatee and then... So it's you and I okay, dressed up. Is it up, Nisha and you? Yeah, or is it, you and I are dressed up as Benifer, which is ironic. Oh, I can see that yes. now. Wow. <laughs> I know. Oh, so great. funny. I like pulled this out and I was like, oh shit. Uh, that's then, good. Yeah. Look at us. And they're back 20 years later. Um, oh my goodness. Um, well, great to see you two. Um, you too. This was wonderful. I hope you Thank had you fun for doing walking this. down the memory lane. <laughs> and uh, I sure did. Fun stuff, guys. Yeah, well, it was good to see thanks. you. Thanks for doing you this. You too. Uh, my pleasure. And thanks for all those lovely voices. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Follow, rate, and review. Welcome to the OC Bitches wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like to watch us, check it out on YouTube or on HBO Max, especially to see that picture of Brody Schwartz, Chris, and Brett with Pamela Anderson. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to start with the pilot episode and catch all of our episode recaps.